I started my apparel business journey in 2016 and sold tens of thousands of products over the following years. In this episode, I'm going to tell you exactly what products I sold, how I sold them, and why I believe this still works today. My name is Kerry Egler, and welcome to the Print On Demand Playbook Podcast. What's up, everybody? It's Kerry here with a solo episode of the Print On Demand Playbook Podcast. Pretty pumped up for this one because I think it's going to be uh, pretty valuable for a lot of people. So I'm excited to jump into it with you. Before I get started with the content of this episode, I want to shout out one of our subscribers that left us a five star review. So I want to shout out Peter F. Money Sign. It's like Peter underscore F. Money Sign. Great name. I love it. Peter said, This is such a great review. Thank you so much for leaving this review, Peter. Peter said, Everyone should be as lucky as I have been able to. Or, Everyone should be as lucky as I have to be able to find and listen to this podcast. I find it personable, relevant, informative, and entertaining. I've been doing research for a long time with Print On Demand. These guys are the most honest, down-to-earth dudes I have come across. What? Wait, you are saying I can... You are not saying I can make 10K in my first 30 days? All the other so-called gurus say that I can. These guys, I know I can trust, and when they say what actually is really involved over and over and don't get, don't use get-rich-quick verbiage. My biggest struggle is whose course do I take? The best solution is to buy both. Keep up the great work, guys, on this amazing podcast. I only have 56 podcasts left to listen to. Man, that was a lot to even process there. Peter, thank you so much uh, for your review. I didn't do a great job reading it, but I got the gist of it, and I hope that's how all of our listeners feel out there is that, you know, we're not throwing get rich quick schemes at you. We're not telling you, you know, you're going to make this crazy amount of money over the next, you know, in the next week. Uh, We want to try to be transparent. We want to try to be um, authentic here and, and give you, give you real information, uh, real strategies and, and tell you the truth. And some episodes are going to be, you know, very, very like, Man, here, look at all the success. And some episodes are going to be like, man, here's the struggle. I've talked about that on recent episodes, some of my struggles. And so, um, yeah, so I, thank you for the review, Peter. And I hope our, all of our listeners feel the same way because that's what we, that's literally what you put in your review is how we strive to be on this podcast. So I really, really appreciate that. So, a quick breakdown of this episode. Number one, I'm going to take you through a quick overview of how I started my first apparel business. Many of you have heard that story, and so I don't want to go super in-depth on that. I just want to give you kind of some quick points on how I got started with my first apparel business and related to how I got into the products that that I ended up selling. Next, I want to tell you the exact products I sold, you know, tens of thousands of these products over the years. And so I want to tell you like what those exact products were. Next, I want to tell you a little bit about how I sold them. What were the strategies? What were the platforms? What were the you know, tactics I used to sell them? Tell you a little bit about that. And then lastly, I want to end this episode by telling you why I still believe this works today. I want to encourage you to stay tuned until the end uh, to hear why I think this is still viable today and what changes I've made and what changes I would recommend that maybe you make uh, in your business for today's world as opposed to when I got started back in 2016. So let's jump into it. Let's start with just some, just kind of a quick overview of how I started my first apparel business and how I got into, uh, you know, the the products that I sold. So the first thing I want to let you know is I I didn't start out wanting to get into print on demand when I started my first store. You know, again, many of you have heard the story, but I got fired from my job uh, like a week later. uh, You know, I decided to start a t-shirt business. Met with a mentor of mine. He said. Hey, give me three business ideas and I'll help you choose one. And one of those ideas that I came up with was a t-shirt business. At that time, I didn't under I didn't know the term print on demand. I didn't know what print on demand was, never heard of it. Uh, I just knew I wanted to sell t-shirts. I, I knew I didn't even really want to sell t-shirts, to be honest. It was just one of the ideas I had because I needed to make some money. So I was fired from my job. I had a one-year-old son at home. My wife was not working because she was staying home when I had my full-time job kind of rushing through that story, but uh, I've told it many times. You know, I believe I've told it on the podcast, but also told it on YouTube and webinars and, and trainings and different things. But I just had this idea to sell t-shirts. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons I came up with this idea for a t-shirt business was because in the past I had worked at a screen printing shop for probably about a year. I think I was 19 years old, maybe 20 years old. And um, I was working at this screen printing shop 
it was this tiny shop that was run uh, and owned by a friend of mine who was much, much older than me. And um, he, funny story, he owned this screen printing shop, but it's actually turned into a huge screen printing uh, and apparel printing business. Uh, they're very, very successful and still around today. And this was, man, when I worked for him was, I think, over 15 years ago. So it's been a long time. How old am I? And when was I 19? Yeah, it's about 15 years ago. Um, so he's had a lot of success. But at the time when I was working for him, he had no employees. I was the only employee. So I was one, one employee and I was part-time. And uh, just a quick kind of funny story. There was uh, he, he was trying to train me to um, to, to learn how to screen print, right. And screen printing, it's kind of an art form. It's, it's, it, it's pretty interesting, but it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's the most difficult thing to learn, but there's definitely some skill involved with it, some muscle involved. So I had been doing a few small jobs. Well, one day he left to go to lunch or something, left me to do a, like a 500 print run for like a school. And I printed like all of these shirts, you know, I was so excited. He gave me a job to do on my own. And I was doing this by myself. I'm alone in this little tiny, his print shop was like in a, like a house. And he comes back, he checks the the 500 shirts that I'd done. They were like jerseys, I believe. And I had printed, I, I think I had printed the wrong print on the wrong side. So like I had printed what was supposed to be on the front on the back or something on like all of them. I had done all of them this way. And it was literally just like a brain like my brain didn't compute that I needed to have them like upside down when I was throwing them on this, you know, on the print screen printer and printing them. I was just going and man, he had to end up, he ended up losing. He ended up having to reprint them all and eat the cost of all those jerseys and all the ink and all the labor. He was really good about it, but man, I felt horrible that day. That was just a funny, quick story. I always remember that story because at the time that business was so small and every dollar counted uh, for his name is Mark. Uh, that I worked for. And I always remember just ruining like 500, uh, a huge job. I mean, that was probably the biggest job that he had at that time. But anyways, I digress. The reason I, that's the reason I wanted to get into t-shirts was because I knew a little bit about t-shirts because I had worked at that screen printing shop. So I, I had a little bit of knowledge on just maybe some different brands and how screen printing worked and those kind of things. So I actually stumbled into print on demand because I didn't have any money. So when I started this online t-shirt store, 2016, get fired from a job, yada, yada, I started this online t-shirt store and I didn't have any money. I, I didn't have anything. Um, so I had to have a way to sell my products and pay for them one at a time instead of buying hundreds of t-shirts up front. And so when I initially started, I started by selling t-shirts on Alibaba or AliExpress. I had watched some YouTube videos on drop shipping, you know, from China. That was really like the only way at the time that you could you could sell physical products without any like capital or upfront money, upfront investment. So I was selling on AliExpress and after I sold a few orders on AliExpress, I quickly realized this wasn't going to work. The sizing was like completely different. These were like China made t-shirts. My customers were really mad. In fact, my first two orders uh, on my store were re refunded. They were both refunded. I think it was like 80 or $90 that I had to refund, which also hurt. I had to eat a lot of money there. I say a lot of money at the time. It was probably, I probably lost a hundred bucks of my own money. But at the time, a hundred dollars was like, oh my goodness, this is like diapers for a, you know, a month probably at the time, pre-inflation, right? <laughs> 2016. Anyways. Um, so I needed a way to, I, I, I after the AliExpress thing, I was like, okay, what do I do? I can't use AliExpress because I have had all these issues. It's it's taking eight weeks to get to my customers. I mean, this isn't this is just isn't a viable solution. How can I do this without money? Am I gonna have to buy t-shirts, yada yada? Anyways, doing through during my research, I found I discovered print on demand. Discovered this business model. And I was like, this is really a thing. This is like, this is really, a th and I still feel like that today. I still feel like this is really a thing. Like, I can't believe that these companies, print on demand companies allow us to sell without really any upfront investment and just pay for the orders as we, as we make them. Because they're, in most cases, the print on demand companies, they're holding the bag, uh, you know, investing the money into all this inventory and labor. And it's like, 
wow, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. It's a pretty incredible business opportunity. I really do believe that. And so I stumbled into print on demand and, um, you know, I want to just be transparent and, and kind of tell you even like who I used. The first company I used was T launch T E E L A U N C H. That was the very first print on demand company that I used. And, uh, I ended up using a few different ones uh, in spurts or maybe in small chunks. I think I used S P O D at one point. Um, and then I ended up landing where most of my volume was done with this company called T Scape, T E E S C A P E. Uh, I sold, you know, tens of thousands, multiple tens of thousands of orders with T Scape. And they're still around today. A uh, very small company. They haven't changed at all in like seven or eight years. <laughs> they're like exactly the same. And as many of you know, uh, you know, my 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 favorite print on demand company today is called Gelato. Uh, G E L A T O, but this is this is many years ago, and so I started with T Launch, and so I, I want to talk about uh, that experience a little bit. And I think they're a good company. I think a lot of the companies that I that I used are they're good companies. Um, I don't want to hate on them at all, but anyway, so I I started using T Launch. There at the time there wasn't there wasn't a lot of print on demands. There was really only a few. I mean there there was there was Printful, Printify. Uh, there was T launch, there was SPOD, there was this little company called T scape and probably a few other ones. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of options there. It wasn't like there was hundreds of print on demand providers. And in fact, I've done YouTube videos where I've gone back in the Wayback machine. You know, if you go on Google and go to Wayback machine, you can actually go back and see the Shopify app store from those years. And I went back to 2016, 2017 and these, you know, years in the Wayback machine is like you search print on demand and it's like 10 apps. <laughs> it's like what? It's wild how much it has grown in 7 or 8 years. Flipping wild. It is it is wild, you know. I would say multi-billion dollar industry, uh, you know, print on demand. Anyways, I think Anyways, so that's how I got into print on demand, started using Tscape. And that moves into kind of the second portion of this episode where I want to tell you the exact products I sold uh, that made me a lot of money and that I sold, you know, tens of thousands of, of, of items. So I'm going to take you through a few here. Um, I don't think any of these are going to be earth shattering. They're not going to like rock your world, you know, with these great products. But I want to tell you what I sold and just how simple it is. I want you, that's kind of what I want you to get out of this section of hearing the products that I sold. Like I wasn't doing anything complex. I still don't, I don't do anything crazy. I'm not trying to find the trendiest product. I, I wasn't, I like, I just wanted to sell t-shirts. Um, and I always kept it pretty simple. I have always kept it simple. And that's still today. I think simple sells. I think simple is always better. And yeah, I'll get into that, uh, later in the episode, you know, why I still believe this works today. But let's talk about the products that I sold. The first product I think that I ever sold with print on demand through T launch was the District DT6000 Very Important T. This is a unisex t shirt. Um, it's, and so some of the things that I guess some of the reasons I chose it number one, it was affordable, um, very inexpensive at the time. I want to say it was like maybe $6. Uh, through T launch, maybe seven dollars somewhere in there. I think today it's still only like nine bucks, ten bucks. It's not crazy, um, but it was very affordable. Um, it fit decent. They had a, a decent amount of colors, you know, average amount of colors, and you know it was on T launch at the time. And so that's the first T-shirt that I went with. And I want to tell you about you know why I ended up switching from this T-shirt and, and that kind of that kind of thing. One of the other things I want to mention is that, and I kind of alluded to this, but this was the only product I sold at the beginning. There was no other products. You know, I started with the idea of, I just need a basic unisex t-shirt. You know, I think women like unisex t-shirts. I think men like unisex t-shirts. You know, I just needed a good all around t-shirt. I wasn't trying to do anything too crazy. And so the t-shirt I chose, this was my core product was the DT6000. And, and I didn't put like a lot of thought into this. It was literally just like, I my this was my thought process at the time. Gildan is cheap. Uh, you know, a lot of these other brands look like they're very expensive. I didn't know a lot about them. This district t-shirt, somewhere in the middle, I think I'd probably had a, I probably had a district t-shirt at home. It was like 
which looks like a decent t-shirt. It's pretty cheap. So maybe, you know, I think my thought process really was, was I wanted an uh, inexpensive t-shirt to sell because I wanted more margin, but I didn't want the perception of the Gildan or like the Hanes because I knew those were really bad. So I was like, I'm just going to go with this district tee. So that was kind of my thought process. And so here's what happened. I started selling these district t-shirts and, and as my, my business started to grow a little bit, um, I started to make more sales and I, I want to break down later how I made those sales, but I started to make more sales. And as my sales started to grow, I started to have issues with this t-shirt. And to be honest, it wasn't the t-shirt. It was the print. I, I was, that's, that was my thought at the time was I was like, I'm getting a lot of complaints and refunds and returns because the printing was not good quality. I wasn't getting complaints about the fit of the t-shirt. I wasn't getting complaints about, you know, the the t-shirt quality. I was getting complaints about the print quality. The colors are faded, the or the or the colors were just dark. Um they just didn't look good. And I of course I ordered some for myself. I also thought it didn't look very good. It was grainy, you know, and and I think if you you know, a lot of people's experience with print on demand and specifically direct to garment printing, which is the print method that print on demand uses in most cases, direct to garment printing. If you've ever had an experience with that, um, a lot of times this is what you experience with print on with direct to garment printing. This is the print method that print on demand uses faded colors or dark, dark colors, you know, a bright red on a black shirt. It's looks more brown. This has been an experience of a lot of people. Now, some I want to be trans or I want to be clear here that this isn't the this isn't always the experience. This is the experience when and there's a couple factors that attribute it attribute to it, but when you use a low quality printer like the print on demand company or the printer is using using a cheaper quality print machine, they're not cleaning the print heads you know, that, that kind of thing. This, maybe the software is not accurate to the color. Uh, but I reached at the time. So I was having issues with this, with this t-shirt, this district t-shirt, the, you know, the print quality was not good. I reached out to T-Launch cause I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what I was doing. I reached out to T-Launch and I said, um, what's going on with this? They're sending replacements. They were taking care of it, but even the replacements were coming out really bad looking, right? And my customers would get a replacement. And they were still complaining, so I reached out to T Launch. I'm like, "What's going on? What what is uh, why why do these look so bad? What can I do? What can I do to fix this long term? Because I can't just keep selling these really bad quality prints." And they gave me this really interesting answer that I wasn't expecting. And I think that they were being truthful. There's kind of a caveat to that, but I, I think they were being truthful for the most part. T-Launch explained to me that sometimes the print quality is actually bad because you have a low quality cotton uh, in the t-shirt. The t-shirt is made of a low quality cotton. And basically what they were saying was, it's actually not the print quality's fault. It's the fact that you chose a low quality or inexpensive t-shirt that uses low quality cotton. We and they said we would recommend that you upgrade the t-shirt. And this was kind of an interesting answer looking back on it because I think it was truthful in some ways and I think some ways probably not as truthful because I do agree with them that choosing a low quality t-shirt blank will give you worse results especially with direct to garment printing. This is one of the downsides of going with a Gildan or a Hanes. It's not just that they shrink, it's not just the fit it's also the fact that the ink does not print as well. Direct to garment printing does not work as well with these lower quality t-shirts. And this is why I always recommend to my students that they choose a little bit higher quality t-shirt because the cotton is of better quality. Okay. So I took their word for it. Now, I think on the other side where that maybe they weren't as truthful as, you know, I think that I think that if you're going to, as a print on demand company, if you're going to offer a product, you need to make sure that the, that, that, that the, the product is of good quality and that like the print is of good quality. If you're having an issue with your print on a certain product, I don't know that you should sell that product. That's just kind of my personal take on it is, and, and listen, pretty much every print on demand sells inexpensive 
t-shirts. Some, some of them don't, but there are, you know, most print on demands are going to have inexpensive options. I just think you need to make sure that the print quality is going to be good on all products. At least, at least there has to be some standard. So it's kind of like, why are you selling me this district t-shirt if it's going to be bad quality? But anyways, moving on. I decided at that point I needed to change my core t-shirt. And the t-shirt that I ended up going with, and I did try a few other ones. I tried the, uh, at the time, you know, the Anvil t-shirt. Um, I don't, I didn't really experiment with the next level as much because, uh, it was a little more expensive, but the, the t-shirt I ended up going with, uh, I think everybody to no surprise, if you've ever listened to me talk about this is the Bella and canvas 3001. So I switched my core product from the district DT 6,000 to the Bell and Canvas 3001. Why did I pick the Bell and Canvas 3001? Well, it was uh, pretty good quality. High, I would say somewhat soft, high quality. I like the fit. It was affordable. It was a little bit more than the district t-shirt, but also less than the next level t-shirt or some of the other options uh, that were on the higher end, the American Apparel stuff, you know, different, different uh, higher end stuff at the time. So it was, it was like in this middle ground, still pretty affordable. It didn't shrink a lot. So I liked the fit. It was just a little bit longer, uh, which I liked and it didn't like shrink a ton. So I didn't wash it one time. And then like, you know, like I was busting out of it. It was like, it, it didn't shrink much. It comes in a lot of colors still, you know, today there's even more colors comes in a ton of colors, which is great. Gives you more flexibility. And it was also widely available. So at the time, I'm using T Launch. I'd had these issues with the district t shirt. And, you know, I was thinking, I might have to switch print on demands at some point, you know. So I want to make sure that the t shirt I go with is one that is widely available. And the Bell and Canvas 3001 has always been widely available among most every print on demand because it's maybe the most popular t shirt on the planet, at least one of them. So that was why I chose to go with the Bell and Canvas uh, 3001. And, um, and I, and this is still the t-shirt I recommend today as just a core, great quality t-shirt. One thing I would mention is there are two versions of the Bella canvas 3001. There's a 3001 C and then there's a 3001, I think it's a U or something like that. One, the, the, the C version is the one that's imported to the USA. The other version, I think it's the U version is the USA made version and it's considerably more expensive. These are essentially the exact same t-shirt. One is made in the USA, one is made elsewhere and imported, and uh, they're essentially the exact, exact same t-shirt. I will say on the 3001C, there, you know, you'll see every once in a while, you'll see some stray strands or maybe some, some quality issues, very sparingly, but here and there. But overall, for the price, I think the Bell & Canvas 3001C is the probably the best t-shirt on the planet to go with. Uh, as just a core staple of what you sell. So that's the Bell and Canvas 3001. Still recommend it to this day. It's a great t-shirt. The next product that I had a lot of, made a lot of sales of is the Gildan 18500 hoodie. Okay, I went with this because after looking at a lot of the hoodies uh, in print available in print on demand, there wasn't a lot. There still isn't like a huge selection of hoodies. I realized that there was a, pretty big price discrepancy with hoodies. You had the Gildan hoodie and there is, you know, other ones like the port port and company, uh, or port authority, uh, a few other, like, you know, the Hanes and like these lower priced ones. But then the, there was like this big jump to like the champion hoodies or the, you know, bell and canvas or some of these higher end hoodies it was a really big price jump. And so I had trouble I had trouble, you know, justifying that price jump and trying to price my products right to still make margin. But after doing my research and like ordering these for myself, you know, the conclusion I came to was that the Gildan 18500 was a widely accepted and and pretty good quality hoodie. I think when you want a hoodie, you're not as concerned about it being the most comfortable thing in the world because you're not wearing you're not wearing the hoodie on your naked body. You're wearing a t-shirt underneath the hoodie. So the hoodie's not going directly on your skin. So you're not as worried, not as concerned about it being like this soft and comfortable. I think it's still important, 
but you're not as worried about it being as like soft and comfortable as you would a t-shirt because that t-shirt's going directly on your skin. Um, so I came to the conclusion that I was like the Gildan 18500 hoodie, it fits pretty good and it's fairly comfortable and it comes in a lot of colors. The pricing is good. And so I think that this Gildan hoodie was pretty widely accepted as just a good solid quality hoodie. And so that's the end, one that I ended up going with and sold a ton. I, in it, my, my most sales all time have always been the Bell & Canvas 3001C unisex t-shirt. My second best selling product has always been the Gildan 18500 hoodie. So those are my core products. The hoodie came later though. The t-shirt Unisex t-shirts was my bread and butter, the, the, the Bell and Canvas 3001. I added the hoodie later. As I added the hoodie, that brings me to my fourth product that I, that I sold, which was the Gildan 18000, so Gildan 18,000 crew neck sweatshirt. This is essentially the same exact product as the Gildan 18500 hoodie, but this is just the Gildan 18,000 crew neck, so it doesn't have a hood. It's essentially the same product. It just doesn't have a hood. Why did I have this in my, my catalog? Well, when I added the hoodie, I figured I also need a crew neck for people that don't like hoodies. What I ended up finding out in my own business was I sold way more hoodies than I, than I ever sold crew neck sweatshirts, but I did make sales with the crew neck sweatshirt. And so it was good to have it in my catalog as an option. So to be completely honest and transparent with you, these Really, those two products, the Bell and Canvas 3001 and the Gildan 18500, those are responsible for probably 90 percent of the sales I have ever made. Those two products uh, are, you know, the best sellers. Um, which again just adds to everything I mentioned at the beginning, which I'm going to talk about more, is just the simplicity. Just you don't need to, you don't need to do anything that's crazy. You just need to have a good design on a decent quality product. It's not that difficult. It's a really simple. Uh, it's a really simple business model. We make it a little too complicated. But anyways, then from there, the Gildan 18,000 crew neck made some sales of that. Then I also did, uh, I also have over the years sold um, a decent amount of youth stuff. So mostly it's been the rabbit skins, toddler and youth shirts. So these tinier shirts. And then I've also sold some of the Gildan Youth shirts. I think it's the 5000B is specifically the model uh, that I've sold the most of. Again, these are much less than just the unisex t-shirts and hoodies. But the rabbit skin stuff, I sold some in the in the early days, then moved more over to like the Gildan uh, stuff and a little bit of the Bell and Canvas Youth stuff. Mainly it's toddler t-shirt, infant t-shirt, and then like a youth t-shirt, like a youth like unisex t-shirt. And, um, what I would say is like the rabbit skin stuff, not the greatest quality, but I think when it comes to like, especially babies, you really don't need the greatest quality. It's, it's not as important as it is for adults, right? If it shrinks a little bit, it's fine. So it, you know, I, most people have been satisfied with those products that I've sold to didn't get a lot of, never have got a lot of returns on those. Some other products that I sold that didn't, didn't do as well but have made some sales over the years, mugs, hats, and tank tops. These were categories that I thought, you know, early on, man, I could really, you know, expand out with these products. And they just never really took off for me. I promoted them. I did, you know, ad campaigns for them. Just never really took off. I'd say I probably sold the most of the tank tops over the years, but not a lot. It's very rare that I sell a tank top. Most people are going with the, the Bella Canvas 3001 or the Gildan 18500 hoodie. Just didn't, just didn't necessarily take off for me. That's not to say that you know it's not a good strategy for you to, to add, to take your best-selling designs and put them on things like mugs, hats, tank tops, um, or youth, you know, youth items. It just didn't work for me in my niche. And it hasn't been the, the best-selling you know, products that I've sold. So those are the products. Um, yeah, there's not much else to say about it. It's pretty pretty simple catalog. Uh, I and, and I think that that kind of just to add on to that, and I want to move into the next section. To add on to that just a little bit, um, I've never been the print on demand seller that is you know making thousands of designs all the time, adding them on thousands of products, listing them everywhere. I had a really simple 
product catalog, a really simple marketing strategy. And that's, that's what I did. So with that being said, let's move into how I sold these products and hopefully you can take some nuggets from this and you'll learn something from it. As you'll see with my selling strategy, also very simple. I like things to be simple because I value my time. Uh, I value um, just the simplicity of, of the work. You know, when you hire a team member, you want it to be simple. When you try to train somebody, you want it to be simple. Try to explain things to people, you want it to be simple. I always think simple is better. So how did I sell these products? Well, I started with Facebook ads. Maybe not the best strategy. Maybe it is, but that's how I started was with Facebook ads. Here's specifically what I did. This is in 2016 area, so keep that in mind. But I had this mentor that you know was the guy that I, I mentioned that helped me decide what business model that I should, should choose. And he was also really into Facebook ads at the time. Now, back in this day, the, a lot of marketers and people will tell you, this was the heyday of Facebook ads. 2016 was just on fire. And I agree with that to some extent. I still think Facebook and Instagram ads are amazing today and still the greatest opportunity out there as like a solo marketer. But a lot of people think they were in their heyday. So I started with Facebook ads because my mentor was also using Facebook ads. So I knew I could lean on him a little bit if I needed some maybe help. So what I did, I started a Shopify store. Within a few days, I popped up my first Facebook ad campaign, one campaign, one image for $5 a day. Oh, just a novel strategy. <laughs> it was so, so uh, creative. Anyways, to my surprise, after one day, about 24 hours in, I got my first sale. And I started to kind of like, in very, very baby steps, scale that up. Seven bucks a day, 10 bucks a day, 20 bucks a day. I think at somewhere around like 20 bucks a day, I was freaking out that I was spending that much on ads. Let me just pull out my calculator because I was thinking of it in this way. If I spend $20 a day on Facebook ads, that's $600 a month. I don't have $600 to my name. How am I going to spend $600 a month on Facebook ads? But as I started to see the sales come in, I started to realize that I could put money in and I could get profits out and that would fund my advertising. So Facebook ads were the primary way that I was bringing in new sales at the time. Here's what's crazy about this. Facebook ads have continued to be a staple of how I sell for over seven plus years. I still use Facebook ads, Instagram ads today. I still use some of the same strategies and tactics I used back then, and they still flip and work. It's crazy. Um, through all of the changes, iOS 14, you know, all these changes with pixels, all these changes with accounts getting shut down, like they still work today. And I still use some of those same strategies. Now I've had a lot of ups and downs with Facebook and Instagram ads. I'm not here to tell you that it's this smooth ride. I've had a lot of periods with Facebook and Instagram ads where they just didn't work, where they weren't profitable. Now, a lot of that can be attributed to maybe just not having a winning design at that time. But the fact, the fact of the matter is if you're using Facebook and Instagram ads primarily as your primary acquisition channel, it's not always going to be roses. You, if you find a winning design and you start to see that that's profitable, ride that flipping wave, milk it for every last dollar because it may not work again. And it, it will probably work again, but it may not, it's not, it may not always be that easy is what I should say. It's not going to always be that easy to just pop up ads and have that kind of success and to be scalable. So Here's what happened. Let me kind of walk you through what happened. I was using Facebook ads, trying to scale this up. That's basically all I was doing was putting out new designs and popping up an ad for them and trying to make it profitable. That was really my strategy in the beginning. And <clears throat> after a few months, Facebook ads stopped working for me at this time. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out why they weren't working. I couldn't figure out how to fix it. And the problem was, was that I had no backup plan. I had no other strategy to fall back on uh, when these you know, Facebook ads were not working. And this is when I realized, and I, I learned probably from going to a conference or reading a book, 
you know, guys like Russell Brunson that I learned, I was really, really learning from at the time. Guys like my mentor, mentor that I was really learning from at the time, other, you know, people and gurus that I was learning from. I realized the huge light bulb moment. I needed an email list. I needed an email list because I realized that my email list is an asset that I could own and that I could have full control of and that no one could take away from me. Mark Zuckerberg couldn't take away my email list. He could take away my Facebook ads, but he couldn't take away my email list. The algorithm, you know, couldn't change. I always had that email list that I could fall back on. This is when I realized it. And so uh, after a little bit of time and I realized this, I started implementing other, th other things that helped me make sales. Email, okay? I started implementing, uh, at the time I was doing messenger, mar Facebook messenger marketing, maybe not the best strategy today, definitely still works, not, but it was kind of the wild west back then. I started implementing things like text message marketing. This is really the early days of text messaging marketing for most people. And I started to go heavily outside of my email list. I started to go heavily into my organic marketing on social media, uh, mainly on Instagram with the whole goal of getting people on my email list and building that email list because I had that light bulb that if I just built my email list, I would always have sales to fall back on. And so luckily, after a little bit of time, I started to get Facebook ads working again. Those be, you know, started working for me again. And, but the strategy changed. The strategy was no longer run a Facebook ad and make a sale. That was not, not my core strategy. My primary strategy with Facebook ads was make sales but also make sure I get those people on the email list. So I put up a pop-up on my website. I started adding in, you know, other ways to get people on my email list. I did giveaways on social media. I was doing these things to build, all to build my email list. Started doing collaborations with influencers, different things like that. Again, the early days of, of influencer marketing. And so I started to really build this email list. And as I saw my email list grow slowly, I started to realize that the more I emailed that email list, the more sales I was getting from email. And my, at first it was, yeah, my sales were all coming from ads and my the little bit of sales coming from email. And it started to go like this, where my email just started growing, right? And, and then it started matching what I was doing on ads and then it started outpacing. But remember, I was using the ads as, as part of my strategy to get people on the email list. And I was upping my organic social media activity and making sales from organic social media and using a few different other things. But this became my funnel and my strategy that I, I was going to use ads in a way that would not only make sales, but if the sales weren't profitable, I could still make profit because I was getting people onto my email list and then I was selling to them in the email. Let me tell you, friends, same thing I've been saying throughout this episode this is still the strategy. This is still the most profitable way to have a profitable online apparel business is build your email list. Figure it out. You got to figure out how to build that email list and send them emails. And, you know, when you're sending emails, it can feel scary. Maybe you don't know what to put in the emails. Maybe you don't, you know, you just don't know how to do it. Just send them. Even if they stink, send your list emails. When they join your email list, they're on their, they're getting, they're joining your email list for a reason. They want to hear from you. So please send them emails. Do it every week. Send at least one or two emails a week to your list. This will pay, pay dividends to you over the long term because Facebook ads are not always going to be profitable at every day of every month. Sometimes they're not going to be as profitable and you have to have that email list to fall back on, right? You have to have these other ways, organic marketing as well with social media to fall back on when you're, when those Facebook ads, Instagram ads are not working. So that's how I sold them. That's how I built my business. So here's why the last portion of this episode, here's why I still believe this works today. First of all, let me say this. There are so many gurus out there, both in the print-on-demand space, the apparel space, and also just in the business marketing space. They like to tell you what works, what doesn't work. Gurus, and, and, and you know, I'm probably guilty of this myself, of saying like, this is the way. This is the only way. This is what works right now. This no longer works. This is a marketing strategy that people use to say, this thing is dead, and this is, this is what works now, Right? But let me give you the truth. 
it all works. It all works. But you need to decide which roadmap and which system you want to follow. You know, people say things like drop shipping is dead, right? Dr- Let me tell you, like drop shipping is not what it was in 2016 or 2017, kind of in the, the heyday where it was really hyped up. But let me tell you, friends, it still works. There are still thousands of sellers making millions of dollars drop shipping trinkets from China. I can't believe it, but I still see them out there. <laughs> not just the not just the gurus. I see these, I get ads. I get ads for these things. It's like, that's crazy. Alibaba is one of the biggest companies in the world, partly because it still freaking works. This drop shipping still works. People say t-shirts are saturated. T-shirts are still the number one selling print-on-demand product among almost every print-on-demand company. The largest print-on-demand companies in the world, the ones that you're thinking of right now, their top selling product, which with most of them say nearly 60% of their sales are unisex t-shirts. It's not rocket science. T-shirts are not saturated. T-shirts are always going to be a, a top selling item. Anyways, there are a lot of gurus that will tell you what works and what doesn't work. It all works. Guys, Etsy, it works. Shopify, it works. T-shirts, they work. Wall art, it works. It all works. It, you just have to decide for you what you want to sell and what what roadmap or system that you want to follow. Because if you go out to YouTube and you watch 50 different gurus that are all telling you different things, you're not going to be able to make sense of it. And you're not going to be able to have success with it. You just got to follow one. My friend, Joe Robert, give him a shout out, man. He's a great, great guy. He teaches print on demand just like I do. And just like Adrian does. Joe Robert says, don't sell t-shirts. They're not profitable. Sell these other things. And I want to let you know, if you go follow Joe Robert and you follow his system and you, and you, you know, join his programs and do what he says, you're going to have success. He's right for his audience. But I would tell you the opposite. I would tell you t-shirts, I still think are one of the greatest opportunities, uh, in print on demand because there's so much demand and you can adapt them to any niche and you can still make tons of profit from them. And we see it every day with our students. And so I'm also correct. And if you want to follow me, you can have success as well. It's all about which path you choose to follow. Okay. And I want to tell you this, that the truth is, yes, I've adjusted how I sell over the years. I've adjusted the strategies I teach to my students, but the core of it is still, it still works, right? There's adjustments, there's tweaks I've made, of course. And I also want to let you know why I believe it still works today is because I see so many success stories inside shirt school. This is not to promote my program. I don't want to make it sound like that, but it's so encouraging uh, when I see my students succeed. And, And one of the reasons it's encouraging, number one is because I get to see them have success. And it's like, man, that's so cool to see you know, my students having success, uh, my friends, really, I didn't want to call them students, my friends having success with this and making new lives for their family and creating new income streams for their family. Uh, that's number one. The number two reason though, is it also reminds me that this works and I get to look at it and I go, man, people like to question whether this works or not, but look at the proof, look at the proof, look at you know, this student that's done, made a seven figure business. Look at all these students that have made multi six figure businesses. Look at, uh, and then look at this student that just got their first sale. Look at this student who just got their 10th sale. And I get to look at that and I get to, I get to say, wow, it's amazing that even though we, there's all the haters, it works. Here's the proof. Right. And you know, anyways, that it encouraged me. It encourages me. Um, And so I also do want to just, I want to throw a soft invite out there for anybody that wants to learn more about my system. Uh, If you want to learn more about shirt school, I did just in talking about this section, I wanted to throw this out there for you. We have a free class. It's over at shirtschool.com. S-H-I-R-T-S-C-H-O-O-L.com. Shirtschool.com. If you go over there, you can actually register for a free class and it's about 75 minutes and I break down my entire shirt school system. I show you a ton of success stories, successful students, and then at the end, I give you an opportunity to check out Shirt School. So I do want to let you know if you've listened to this episode and you're like, man, I want to do this. I'm ready. If you're ready to go, 
if you're ready to, to do this and have success with it, go check out the free class over at shirtschool.com. Set aside a little bit of time. Maybe in the evening you put your kids down or you know the house gets quiet. Put it on the TV or put it on your iPad or even on your phone. You can watch it. Probably recommend get it on a big screen though. Get out a notepad. Take some notes. Learn about uh, my system and how it works. And and I believe that you will you will understand, or I believe that you will start to believe that it can work for you. Uh, you know when you watch that class. So shirtschool.com if you want to check out that free class. So that's gonna wrap it up for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I want to thank you again for listening to this episode of the Print On Demand Playbook Podcast. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thanks so much for listening to the Print On Demand Playbook Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us an honest review on whichever platform you're listening from. Thanks again and have a great day.